Happy Sabbath to everybody. Um, spring is just here, so I, I hope that you all are happy about that. And we are here for the first Sabbath for spring, and, and no better timing to have a youth rally and a lot of people in this church we call home. Very comfortable seats, comfortable faces, smiling faces, and um, you know what, I don't know about you, but it's been a rough week for some of us, but it's been a blessed weekend. Amen? We're going to start our praise and worship uh, with some of the songs led by the devoted the conference praise band. So our first song this morning will be, I will not be shaken.
about 10,000 visitors.
sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. Sing your praise to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the melodious song, with trumpets and the sound of the ram's horn. Make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Amen.
Uh, so today's scripture reading today is taken from John 1, verse 35 to 38. John 1, verse 35 to 38. And it says, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, Why are you why do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, then translated teacher, where are you sit where are you staying? And God has a message to the name of his book. As far as possible, let us meet with the prayer.
Psalm 78, verse 4 reads, We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. Christianity was never meant to be kept to ourselves. We have a responsibility to be Christ's ambassadors, sharing His good news with the next generation. And there is so much to share. But how many examples of God's glorious deeds can we share about? What can we tell others about His power? What are what of His mighty wonders can we share? The problem is we don't pay enough attention. We take all that God does for us for granted. We are spoiled, acting like we have some sort of entitlement. So we reduce God's message, keeping the good news to ourselves. But the truth is, people are hurting, dying, incomplete, and disillusioned. They would do anything to learn about a God that is real. Sure, we must share the saving message of the gospel, but if we are going to win a generation, then they also need to know about all the great things God is doing. Let's begin to pay more attention to God at work around us and start sharing with those we know. God's glory sees power and mighty wonders.
Christ. I've uh, graced this platform a few times this year, but uh, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Alexa Tu, and I'm currently serving as uh, the chair of Youth Under the Influence of Christ, or YUI. And we would just like to thank uh, your church family so much for hosting us again this weekend. This is the third event in the past year that you have hosted for us at Black. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd just like to thank the many members of YUI who have helped plan this event. Uh, we have Tiana, Samantha, Ryan, who have been helping out with the music, Fiona and James who are here on the platform with me. I also just want to thank the many young people who have helped out today, uh, Agatha and Rianne, um, as well as my co-chair, Boris, who's been helping, our vice chair. I call him co-chair, though, because you know him. He does just as much work as I do. My vice chair, Royce, who has been uh, helping plan this event, and the other members of the board of uh, But most of all, just thank you to your church for hosting us. Our youth director for the Mad Fast Conference, Richard Williams, is here. I'd just like to invite him up for a couple of minutes just to bring you greetings from our conference. Have you been blessed so far this morning? Amen. Amen. I want to say welcome to the YUI weekend from the conference. Uh, bringing greetings from President Ron Nelson and our treasurer, Abednego Manalupa, and a well-known person to you, our secretary, Jeff Potts. Uh, they wanted to send their greetings to you uh, this morning, and uh, especially to our young people. And I, I want to say I, I'm so impressed with YUI. Since I've come here, and it's been almost two years now that I've been here, uh, this committee has worked and worked and worked to put on events here in Winnipeg for our young people. And, and I know I've been blessed by the few I've been able to come to, and I know the young people here have been blessed too, as well. So thank you, Alexa, and thank you to the young people who are working with her, uh, especially the praise group. Uh, I've spent some time with some of them in, in uh, Belize on a mission trip, uh, so they have a special place in my heart. But thank you so much for your ministry to the kids and, and you. Of, of this community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Richard. Uh, before I call up our speaker, I would just like to tell you a little bit about who Pastor Lindsay Sai is. Uh, I have uh, a little bit of information about who she is. So Lindsay was born the 4th of 5th century. Yes, I know. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay was born the 4th of 5th of five children in Miami Beach, Florida to Gus and Linda Sai. Pastor Sai attended Oakwood University from 2007 to 2011. She was first baptized with her best friend at the age of eight, but in her first semester in her freshman year at Oakwood University, she was rebaptized. It was then that she realized that all her life, she wasn't truly a Christian, a true follower of Christ. She felt she was merely going through the motions and lived up to what was expected of her. She was beginning to discover God on a much deeper and personal level and felt the call to ministry in her freshman year at Oakwood, but she didn't accept it then. Pastor Sai graduated with honors in pre-physical therapy. She applied to six graduate schools, Teach for America, and a teaching position, but didn't get any of them. She knew it wasn't because of her grades or qualifications, so she began talking with God. She challenged God and told God that if he wanted her to go to Anne University, she would apply, this time to the seminary. If she got in, she would accept his call to minister and serve. After next week, Pastor Sai would have completed her first year at the Anne University Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, Michigan, where she has, she has begun her journey to serve God and awaits with anticipation to see God move within her life beyond this experience. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, traveling, and mentoring youth and young adults. Her ultimate desire is to be broken daily so the Holy Spirit can fill her up. She longs for that day when she can sit at the feet of her Savior and there will be no more death, and when God will wipe away all tears from every eye. Pastor Sai, we welcome you so much to uh, speak to us this morning. And just before she speaks, I'd like to invite Faith Campos up to do our special music. Thank you. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. The song said, this is my desire. Amen. To honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. And to me, that's more than a song. That's right. That's more than words mm -hmm. that we hear. That's right. Speak. That's a prayer. Mm -hmm. Because every day that I live, that's what I want to do. Amen. I want the Lord to have his way in me. Don't you want the Lord to have his way in you? That's right. And it says, to honor you with all my heart, I worship you. All I have is in you. I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. I want to thank you so much for those beautiful words. That's one of my favorite songs by Anthony Evans and other artists singing. But that's a prayer that we should pray in our lives. That the Lord can have his way in our lives. I want to thank you all for the invitation to come to Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, I was sharing with the young people last night that when I met Pastor Guzman, I never heard of Winnipeg in my life. <laughs> so I thought Winnipeg was in South America. So I was like, yeah, I would love to go. <laughs> but when I accepted the call, I, I was honored that Alexa, you know, when she corresponded with me, she said that God has saw fit that they would appoint me to be on this mission. So I'd like to thank God for that first and foremost. And, and secondly, I'd like to thank you to, uh, for the young people who are actively serving in this area. You all keep up the good work. I commend you for what you're doing. Because you're encouraging other young people to do something for the Lord. Do something unique in your own way. Not worrying about what people think of you. But, you know, just serving the Lord with all of your heart. I see that there are a lot of Filipinos in the congregation. And I went to the Philippines one time. And I want to give you some greetings. Hopefully I say it right. Mangandangabi. Okay. So my, my mission was not in vain. At least I left there with knowing at least pahalam. That's like goodbye. Uh, but don't tell me goodbye yet. But, um, don't tell me goodbye. But I want you all to turn with me in your Bible. To John chapter 1. Put me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. I thank you for beautifully reading it, James. John chapter 1. It's one of my favorite Gospels. And I'll read in your hearing. Verses 35. John chapter 1, verses 35. When you have it, say amen. amen. If you're still looking for it, say hold on, preacher. <laughs> Alright, it says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. How many disciples? Two. Two disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Let's bow our heads in prayer. God of heaven, we thank you so much for another awesome moment to spend time with you. And God, I acknowledge that it's not by the words that I will say, but the words that you will say through me. So hide me behind your cross. I put, put those coals on my mouth so I can speak to your people. Speak, Lord, your servant here, Lord. And I just pray that at the end of this moment, at the end of our time here, Lord, lives will be changed. You said that your words will not return unto you, boy. It will not, God. So someone here today is wrestling with making a decision to follow you. But God, I pray that you can set them free today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a show in America that I started to watch a couple of years ago. You know, it caught my attention because it was something that I would not see out of the blue. 
The show was called Undercover Boss. How many of you have heard that show? I think they have an edition here in Canada, Undercover Boss. Each episode features a high-ranking executive, the owner of a corporation going undercover as an entry-level employee in his own company. So just think about it. A guy or a, a woman who has so much money, you know, they're making all this money at their company, and they come and they take this position as a lowly person. The executives are their own, are altering their appearance and assume an alias in a fictional backstory. So one particular episode, there was this guy. You know, he was the CEO of a cruise line company. So you know, you know the cruises, they make so much money. You know, there are people who are traveling back and forth from the different docks to go on vacations, whether it's ferry or anything like that. But he, he didn't come as the CEO that day. He came as a regular employee. So I can only imagine what was going through his mind. He may have said, I hope no one catches on to what I'm doing. I hope no one figures out you know, what my intentions are. But for him to do that, it must have been something drastic going on in his company. You know, the company was making so much money, but he felt as though that the customer service was not up to par. He felt as though that the employees weren't treating the customers who were coming to his company the way that they should have been treated. So he came as a man who looked just as common as you and me. A man who had who had digits behind his, his, his bank account that I would probably never have in my lifetime to come and take this position. So you know how we get that. If we see someone who is of high esteem, we act totally different. Now I may have been the prince of, or the, I mean the princess of, you know, of a foreign country, but I wouldn't have told you that. But if I would have told you that, you probably would have been treating me more, you know, you treat me, you treat me good, but you would have been treating me with more esteem as, you know, some people would normally would. So I remember a time where I had a company a couple years ago, and there was this, you know, this agency who was trying to get me to advertise through their company. So I looked like a regular employee. I had on my work clothes, I had on my pants, I had on my sneakers, and I was just trying to, you know, make make a transaction in the bank. So this lady gave me a hard time because she was trying to make, I'm um, trying to get all this business, but she didn't know who I was. I don't look like a CEO of my own company. I just looked like a little girl who was just trying to make a deposit at the bank. So she treated me as such. She was talking to me as if I was lower than I was, and all I can think was, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> you know, you may be working for me one day, and you're talking to me like, you know, I'm just some little kid who doesn't know what they're talking about. But as soon as she asked me, you know, all of my information, she, she straightened up. She was like, oh my, I'm talking to someone important. And I was like, yes, you are talking to someone important. But the point that I'm trying to make was, or is right now, is that that's how Jesus came on this earth. And when John talks about it in, in chapter 1, verses 35, he says that Jesus was passing by. He was passing by with, you know, a whole entourage of people. And, J and John's mission on earth, on earth was to prepare the way for the Lord. There was so much going around and, you know, he was baptizing, he was preaching, he was rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but John knew his place. He knew that he was preparing the way for the Lord. So everyone knew that he was to come, but did not know how Jesus was coming. So one day in John chapter 1 verse 29, let's look at verse 29. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So after John baptizes Jesus, you know, he sees the Holy Spirit come upon him on a, as a dove. and He knows that this is the Son of God. 
You know, the Lord has many names. When you read the Old Testament, he has many names that he goes by. And each one of his names tells us something about who he is and what he does. My name is Lindsay. And when I looked up as a kid what my name meant, it meant beautiful isle. So I'm like, what's a beautiful isle? Like, I'm just an island that's beautiful? You know, that was nothing cool about that. Some people had, you know, grasshopper or different things like that, but I was beautiful. I, but when I look at the name of Jesus, it doesn't compare to what my name means. His name is El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty. His name is El Olan, the, the Most High God. It's Adonai Master, Amen. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Those are his names. Jehovah Rapha, the, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Amen. Those are his names that don't compare to beautiful Isle. Now I don't know about you, but at the mention of that name, things begin to happen. When you just say Jesus, demons begin to tremble. When you, when you say the name Jesus, situations begin to change. I mean, you know, the demons, you know, they just start running all over the place when you say Jesus. The lame begin to walk, the, the, the mute begin to speak at the name of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Just at that name, sins are forgiven. Broken homes are restored. Leopards are healed. Young people are straightening up their act when we call on the name of Jesus. When we look at verse 35, the, the next day, John was there again with two of the disciples. <clears throat> and 36 says, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And when the disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. All they heard him say was, look, the Lamb of God. That one name the Lamb of God. So I can imagine those disciples when they were growing up, they, they took a class on the plan of salvation. And they learned about, you know, the origination of sin and how it took place. They learned about a man by the name of Adam and a woman by the name of Eve, who God created in his own image. We all are created in his image. And God, he told them, do not eat of that fruit. But you know how some of us get, you know, when our parents tell us to do something, you know, we're a little curious. I remember my grandmother, she told me one day she visited from Philadelphia. She said, Lindsay, do not ride that bike in the mud. So I was so excited, you know, I'm riding the bike and, you know, I don't want to listen to her. So I'm riding it in the mud and next thing you know, I slip off the bike and I bust my lip. And she said, but didn't I tell you to not ride the, the bike in the mud? And all I could do was just, just cry and have a busted lip. She had to tape it up with some butterfly tape. And, but she said, Lindsay, don't do that. And she had to clean up my mess as a result of my disobedience. So as soon as Adam and Eve, they, they ate that fruit, the things began to change. There had to be another game plan that was instituted because of that one choice that they made. So their eyes were open to sin. They knew that they were naked, but nakedness was the norm for them because God clothed them in his, in his glorious light. So as soon as they bit that fruit, they knew instantly, oh my sin. So they're, they're trying to get fig leaves to try to clothe themselves, but God says, no, that's not good enough. He says, I have to kill an innocent animal in order to clothe you. Something that's innocent in order to make you warm. And that's what he had to do. Because of that one sin, they did not listen. He didn't get the, the clothes from a, a fancy department store, no. He didn't go to Marshalls, he didn't go to Target. <laughs> He didn't go to Walmart, he didn't go to the Macy's or whatever department store that you have here that's fancy Forever 21. He did not go to those places. He had to take
take an innocent lamb and slay it to, to give them clothing. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And then without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of sin because, because if there's no shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. This tells us how terrible sin is and was in, in the sight of God. That he had to sacrifice a precious animal, a precious lamb, for us. And this is also seen in the time of the Exodus during the Passover. When they had to slay the lamb and pour the lamb's blood on the post of, of the doorpost. That was to signify that, you know, Christ was our Passover lamb who was sanctified for us. So when the disciples heard this, when the disciples heard, Behold, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, that reminded me of, of Isaiah chapter 53. And if some of you are reminded of or know about Isaiah chapter 53, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. And let's look at number 2, verse 2. It says, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom... Men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. There was nothing attractive about Jesus' appearance that day. Nothing. He didn't go to Armani, Armani Exchange to buy a nice suit. He didn't have the nicest shoes on when he walked through that village that day. He didn't have any of that. There was nothing to attract him. He didn't have the axe for men on. And that smells good. You know, when the guys wear, I'm like, you know, running, I'm like, I don't do that. But, you know, he didn't have any of that on him that day. Nothing to cause us to take a second look. You know, that guy that we pass by who, who's homeless, who has no shoes, who, whose clothes are ripped up. We don't even take a second look to drop money in his can. Yeah, nothing like that to make us look at him a second time. He was looked down on and passed over. A man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, though he was a scum. You know what the word scum means? We looked at him as if he was scum. Scum is a layer of dirt, informal, a worthless or contemptible person or group of people. So that day, those disciples should have been looking at scum. But they saw something more than scum. They saw that the man walking in front of us is our sin. The, the lamb that would be slain for, for the sins of the world. That one man, as a result of, of Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. And me personally, I don't like scum. I'm going to be honest. When I see a glass that I washed and it has like all those discolorations on it and it still has dirt on it, I'll rewash it again in order for me to actually drink out either the cup or drink out of the plate. I don't like it. But for them to say, I want to follow this man, in some versions it says immediately they followed him. Let's look back at our text. In verse 36 it says, when he saw them passing by, or no, verse 37 it says, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed him. 
In turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? So one of you all turn to your neighbor and say, what do you want? What do you want? I can imagine Jesus saying, what do you want with me? I have nothing about me that makes me look attractive. I have nothing about me that will make you take a second look at me. Why do you want to follow me? Why do you want to learn where I'm staying at? But for those two disciples that day, it was more than how he looked. It was what he represented. Because further down during those years and three and a half years from that day, he would die for their sins. It was more than just, you know, him looking bad on the outside. And Jesus is not looking for us just to choose something that's popular. Adventism may not look popular. Some of the things that, you know, we say, you know, man, we can't play on the Sabbath or I want to do what I want to. Some of those things may not be popular, but, but Jesus is not saying, hey, I want you to follow me because it's popular. I want you to follow me because you love me. In that day, that's what it showed. It showed some kind of, of love that they, they would look past the outside and look at what it represented. And when I look back at this, God was, he was that undercover boss. He came here under another name. He didn't come as the Rose of Sharon that day. He didn't come as Jehovah Nisi, although he was Jehovah Nisi. He didn't come there as El Shaddai or Adonai. He came there that day as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That's where he came as, the, the Lamb of God, because if he had to come in majesty and glory and honor, he would have gotten all the friends. That's right. He would have gotten every friend request that day. Every friend request. But as a result, he didn't, he didn't want to just come with that majesty. He wanted people to see him for who he was. He's not the most popular guy in that day. People will look past his, his timeline, if some of you all are familiar with Facebook, and just read, okay, yeah, this is what he's saying today. They will read past it and not take a second look. He was an outcast in his class. That's what he came there today for that. So when those two disciples saw him, they wanted to follow him. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? They wanted to find out his whereabouts so that they can learn more about him. And when we look in terms of our lives, when we look in terms of our Christian journey, how we're trying to learn more about Christ, he wants us to come and see what it's all about. Not because, it, like I said, it looks popular, but because we're in it for something more than that. I was reading the other day, or probably yesterday, there was an excerpt in Steps to Christ, and I love that book. I had to give it up yesterday on the plane to a guy that I was sitting next to. This guy told him I was going to mention him in the sermon last night, but I forgot, but his name is Cameron. And Cameron, this guy, he didn't look, you know, pleasant at all. But, you know, for him to have a ticket to go somewhere, you know, someone must have cared about him. And Cameron, you know, I sat next to him on the plane. I saw him in the airport. I didn't say anything. And normally I'm friendly, you know, I talk to people who sit next to me on the plane. And Cameron, you know, he smelled like he had liquor upon him. Mind you, it's like nine something in the morning, high liquor. Not like he was drinking a shot or two, like he had down a whole bunch of alcohol that morning. And when I was talking to Cameron, something, act, something prompted me to ask Cameron, Cameron, um, what do you think about commitment? Do you think um, commitment is a word we pass around and stuff like that? And from then on, that conversation lit up. He was like, it's funny that you said that to me because that's something that I'm struggling with today. He said, I'm struggling with commitment. This is my second time going to the rehabilitation center. And I was like, oh my. The second time. He said that, you know, he's an alcoholic. And I was like, yeah. 
you know, what do I do? What do I say? So as I was talking to him before that, you know, I inquired about his schooling. He said he loved to play soccer. He was, you know, he did associate's degree, and he said, what are you, you know, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor on my way to Winnipeg. And, you know, I thought he was going to shut down from there, but something wanted him to learn more. Something intrigued him to learn more about God that day. And as, I, as we were talking about just about life and about how he can get his life back on the right track, mind you, Cameron, I said this earlier, he did not have anything that would make me want to talk to him. Nothing at all. Why do I need to talk to this guy sitting next to me on the plane for? But because, you know, the Spirit prompted me to just inquire about his needs, to see how he was doing, just to share the love of Christ with him, because the, the same God who, who would die for all, the sins of those disciples is the same God who would die for Cameron as well. And he needed to hear the same message that you are, are hearing today. So I talked and I said, Cameron, read that book. Such the Christ has helped many people come closer to God. It's helped many people change their life around and with tears in his eyes. I said, I'll read that book. Because I said, this book will give you salvation one day, but you have to read it. You have to believe it. You have to trust that God will get you through every situation that, that he is your lamb. So I got off the plane. Get my bag, walking down to the next corridor. And there's a lady who was sitting in front of me. She was just smiling, and I smiled back. I said, hey, you know, how are you doing today? So she said, oh, I just commend you for talking with that young man. I said, oh, it's no problem at all. I love to meet new people. I love to talk to people. She said, because my son, his name was Jamie, my son is struggling with the same addiction as Cameron. I was like, wow. If I would have passed Cameron by, if I didn't talk to him, if I would have put the headphones on and tuned out, 28 minute flight, but it took about five minutes to witness. Amen. Five minutes, that's all it takes. That's all it took for these disciples to, to hear about Jesus. John the Baptist was their mentor. But then they wanted to hear about the greater mentor. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Lord, but they wanted to learn more about the way, the truth, and the life. They wanted to know more about him. And this text, this, this excerpt from Steps of Christ says, man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. <clears throat> This was the original plan until sin entered into the world. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God. His thoughts were pure, his aims holy, but through disobedience his powers were perverted, and self selfishness took the place of love. His nature became so weak and through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. He was made captive by Satan, and would have remained so forever had God specifically, especially in a pose. It was the tempter's purpose to throw the divine plan in man's creation and fill the world with woe and desolation. And he would point to all this evil as a result of God's work in creating man. And Jesus' mission was to seek and to save the lost. That was his main mission. His, his, his mission was to tell others about, you know, the soon, his soon return when he, after he died. But he, he didn't only want them to keep it to themselves. He, he wanted them to tell one another about what was coming next. And when I think about this world and the things that's going on around, they need someone like you to tell them about what's happening next. They need someone that was like John to say, Behold the Lamb of God, who take away the sin of the world. And if John would have kept his mouth closed, just imagine where those two disciples would have been. Just imagine how the outcome of their lives would have been. And today God is calling someone who is brave enough to tell him about someone else. 
or to tell about his love to someone else. And when I think about the cross and what it means for me, it's more than just a song. The cross is more than just a song. It represents so much more. It represents the sins that I've created in my life. The Bible says all have sinned and, and fallen short of the glory of God. And that was his main purpose to come back. To set all of us free from whatever we're going through. And I don't know what's holding you captive today. Maybe your, your attitude. It may be a lifestyle that you're living. It may be a struggle that you're holding on to. But Christ today is trying to give someone freedom in who he is. He doesn't want you to just take on something that looks popular. But he's calling you to, to accept him today for what he represents. Your sin offering. Someone who got nails in his side for, for you and for me. And as our grace team, they, they prepare our song on page 321 in the songbook. As they prepare to sing the song, I want you to just, just think about your life for a second. Think about the love that Christ has for you and for me. Think about that day that when those two disciples saw and looked at God, that they stopped everything that they were doing in order to follow, to follow God. The song says, my Jesus, I love you. I know that our God. Place. I've been to 
been before. That's one of the beautiful places in, in Alberta and in that area. That's a beautiful place. Just think God left something that is beautiful as that to come and, and dwell in the slums. And not only that, they looked at him as if he was a slum or scum. I want you to think about it in your life. Think about how you're living your life. How are you, how are you discipling for Christ? He's not just saying, follow the, the one who prepares the way for me. But he wants you to follow the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is calling someone today to make a stand. I know week after week we make appeals, we say give your heart to Christ, but but last time it wasn't real. Last time you just did it because you know you was in the in the moment when you saw your friends doing it, but but today it can be real. Today you can reconnect. Today you can surrender your all to Christ. I don't know what you're holding on to. But anything that that is not leading you to Christ. Sin. Anything that's not that leading you to heaven, it's it's sin. Maybe it's, it may not be pornography. It may be your attitude. Some some people just talk on things that are unseen, but let's talk about some of the things that are seen. Some of you may be stealing or, or lying or cheating or cursing people out. That's not just an American thing. Sin happens across the world. I'm calling someone today to make a stand for Christ. You may want to recommit your life to God today. And if that's your prayer, that you want to reconnect with God today in your life, I want to invite you to stand with me today. You want God to be the Lord of your life. You want him to be the Lord if you want him to come in and to change your life. I want you to think about it. Just stand. Don't do it because your neighbor is doing it, but do it because you really want to make that connection. This next appeal is for a young person. This is a youth weekend rally. And there may be a young person who may want to Take that next step, not only through Bible studies, I know you study Bible studies intensely, but it may be born again through the blood of Christ through baptism. And all of heaven rejoices when there's one. One person who, who says that I want to, to wash away my sins. The Bible says, when the Son sets free, they're free indeed. And I, I love it because I'm the type of person, I love things that are free. I don't want to have to pay for anything. Amen. But when Christ says that I can be free, I don't have to pay anything, that's a beautiful thing. Because that means you don't have to come out your pocket and scrounge for funds to, to get your own salvation. Because he said, I paid it on the cross. And if that's your prayer, young person, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. If you want to be born again, washed in the blood, you may be a smoker, you may be a drinker, you may, you may partake in premarital sex. That's you. He's calling you today. While you're making that decision, let's pray. I want to pray for those who are making that decision because the word said his words won't return unto him, boy. I believe that. And I believe there's someone under the sound of my voice today, God, that who wants to make a heartfelt decision. But because of so many attempts of coming, Lord, they failed so many times. But God, you don't look at us like that. God, Lord, you said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that if we have to keep coming back and back and back, Lord, you say you'll take us. So Lord, be with that one person. I only came for one. You only 
rejoice over one God. Lord, there's someone here today. There's a parent in here today. An uncle or an aunt in here today. Who wants to make that stand? If that's you, just raise your hand or come down to the front.
you so much for just who you are. And God, I pray that as we leave this place, never from your presence, Lord, that we can take you within our heart everywhere that we go. Whether we're going home, Lord, or to a friend's house, whether we're going to the grocery store, from, you know, or wherever we go. And I pray that we can tell others about your soon return. We thank you, we love you, God, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <laughs>